This will be a lecture on propensity score matching. In this lecture, I will first talk about the treatment evaluation studies and uh, I will give you a few examples and the definitions of what would be treatment evaluation. Then I will define the propensity score methodology. First, I will talk about treated and control groups and uh, assignment uh, based on treatment. Then we will talk about the private and logic models and how to estimate propensity and propensity scores. Then I will talk about matching methods for treated and controlled observations uh, and the differences between them. And finally, I will show you how to estimate those treatment effects. Then we will talk about assumptions in propensity score matching that are used and we will conclude with difference in differences models. So let's get started. The definition for treatment evaluation is that that is an estimation of average effects of a program or treatment on the outcome of interest. So what that means is that we would typically have a program or a treatment implemented to some group and another group will not receive that treatment. So the group that received the treatment we will call the treated group and the group that does not receive the treatment we would consider that as the control group. And then we would want to estimate so what is the effect of this treatment or program on the treated group and we would use the control group as a comparison group. And uh, we are interested in a particular measure or measures and this would we would call outcome measures. So a few examples here of treatment evaluation. The most popular one is when we estimate the effects of a training program on job performance. So here we have people that receive training and other people that don't receive training and then we want to evaluate what is the um, effect of this training program on their job performance? Another example is where we have government programs uh, which are meant to help uh, schools and say they're, as they're implemented only in certain states but not in others. And what is their effect on student performance if you're part of uh, if you've received that training and what if you didn't receive that training. So inherently there are two types of studies. The first one is uh, controlled experiments where assignment into treated and control groups is random and this is when we have mostly like lab experiments where you have the two groups and you say you get the treatment and you get the placebo you don't get the treatment and then we will compare your outcomes but real life is usually not like that and when you collect data it's usually not like that so we have observational studies where the assignment into treated and control groups is not random which means that there's a program and certain individuals decided to participate in that program and others didn't so because the people that decide to participate in the program may be different than the people that didn't participate in the program that's why it's kind of hard to directly compare the outcomes for those two groups and we first need to match them as much as possible and then compare their their outcomes so this is what we will be doing here in more details these are the steps of the propensity score meth matching methodology in the first step we are assigning the observations into two groups the treated group that received the treatment and the control group that does not receive the treatment. And here is um, when you say receive the treatment, that may be just the opposite. For example, maybe your treated group is the ones that opted out of a program. So you have to be careful how you define the treated groups. That's the group of interest and the one that we want to calculate the effect on. So sometimes that's the ones that have the yes, and the participation and the tr and but other times it may be a group that doesn't have something uh, if that's of interest to you so we would call the treatment D um, as a that would be a binary variable and that would determine if the observation has the treatment or not 
and d would be equal one uh, to one for treated observations and d would be equal to zero for the controlled observations. So again, the treated ones are the ones that participated in the program or got the treatment and d equals zero would be for the controlled observation. So now that we've assigned the observations into these two groups, we can estimate a binary outcome model for them. That's a typically a pro probit or a logit model for the propensity of these observations to be assigned into the treated group. And we will use x variables that may affect the likelihood of, of being assigned into the treated group. So here's the model, and if you look at this, we have p of x. That's the probability of d equals 1 given x, and that will be the expected outcome of d given x. So this is exactly like the probit and the logit models that we talked about in one of the other videos. So the propensity score model is, is exactly a probit model. And what we want to get out of this model is those predicted probabilities, p hat, or these conditional um, probabilities of receiving a treatment given their pretreatment characteristics x. So notice that all of these x variables that you need to put in your model, those are pretreatment characteristics because you want to know what the influence some individuals being assigned to a program while others not. Okay, so once we have estimated a probit model or the propensity score model, now we would have these predicted probabilities for every observation. And once we have those, what we want to do is instead of matching on X, which is their pretreatment characteristics. And these are like, we want to match on age, on education, on, e on income, or something like that. But instead of matching on each of these x individually, what we do is we lump them up into a propensity score. And now we would be matching on that propensity score. So that's what we are doing in the next step. Um, where we match the observations from the treated and the control groups based on their propensity scores. And notice that the goal here is to find a match for each of the treated observation. And we will talk uh, later on. The goal is not to find a match for the controlled group. So as a consequence, sometimes you may not use all of the controlled observations because we want to find the best possible match for these treated observations. And there are several matching methods that are available, including the kernel, nearest neighbor, radius, and stratification. And I will talk about these in more detail on the next slides. And once we found the matches, then the next step would be to calculate the treatment effects. So we would compare the outcomes y between the treated and the controlled observations after matching. And here y1 would be the outcome for the treated group where d equals 1, and y0 would be the outcome for the control group where d equals 0. And the problem here is we have counterfactual situation. We want to compare the outcomes of the treated group with the outcome of the treated group if they were not treated. But because that's not possible, the treated group is treated, you know, and you can't like remove the treatment away from them or something like that we need to find very close matches for those treated observations and then use their outcome and say, okay, that's good enough. And we would compare the outcomes for the treated and the control group for the, for the observations that are very similar to each other. And I will also explain this on uh, some of the next slides. So let me go ahead and first elaborate on that point, how to find good matches. So this is a graph that I came up with. You will not see it in textbooks or other things. So suppose that we have here's the treated group and here's the control group. And then from the probit model of the first step where we estimate the propensity score, that's a, a value between 0 and 1, right? Predicted probability should be limited between that. And suppose that we have four treated observations and the propensity score is equal to, say, 0.9 for this one, 0.7 for this one, 0.5 for this one, and 0.4 for this one. And for the control group, we have here 0.9, uh, 
uh, 0.7 and so on to say 0.2. So now what I'd like to do is find very good matches for these treated groups. And so suppose I'm looking at this one for this person. What would be a really, really good match for this person here? And I'm looking and maybe I could have that one as a match because it seems like very similar propensity score. Uh, how about this one? Well, I don't know, maybe this one or this one. And that's how we will be looking for matches. And sometimes we would get out of the out of the limit a little bit for, for one of them and uh, may or may not have very good matches, but we'll try. So let's use some terminology. So for each treated observation I, we would need to find matches of controlled observation J with similar characteristics. So sometimes it's one match and sometimes it could be multiple matches that we can find. And there are several matching methods with or without replacement. If we match without replacement, this means that if we say use this one for a match for this one, then this one w we can't use it for, for a match for anybody else. Now, if we use it for with replacement, we would put this one back in the pool and we can use it as a match for other uh, treated observations. So if we keep it in the pool, then, well, maybe we'll have closer matches for the, for the treated group, but we, we may end up using one, too, you know, one of them too many times. If we leave it out, then the matches probably wouldn't be as good just because they wouldn't be very close. So there are trade-offs um, for these two methods. Okay, so these are two types of matching that we can use. The first one is kernel matching. And here, for each observation of the treated group, we would use all of the observations from the control group where we are going to weigh them. The closer it is in propensity score to this one, the higher the weight. And as it goes down, uh, further away in propensity score, we would put lower weights on these. So we would kind of have um, an average number where the weights are going to be very high on the, on the observations that are close in match and very low on the observations that are farther away. Another matching method is the nearest neighbor matching. And this one is the method for this one. This is the nearest neighbor for this one. That's the nearest neighbor. But for this one, maybe this one is also the nearest neighbor. So we can use something like that. Another one, and I don't have a figure here, but it's a radius matching. So if that's an observation that we need a match for, we would put a certain radius and we would use all of the observations that come from within the radius here. And another one is stratification matching where uh, you can basically divide them into blocks like that, into five blocks. And for observation in this block, we would use those from, that, from the matching block. From this block, we would use matching from that block and so on. So we would be, we would have matches by blocks, by blocks. So this is more formally the nearest uh, neighbor matching method, method. And for each treated observation I, we would select the controlled observation J that has the closest X. So what we're trying to minimize here is the distance between PI and PJ. And these are the propensity scores. So if the propensity score is of 0.83, we would want uh, someone from the control group that has very, very similar propensity score. Next one is radius matching. So here for each treated observation I, we would match them with controlled observation J that fall within a specified radius. So we would want that distance to be less than R. And for the kernel matching, we would have that each treated observation I would be matched with several controlled observations where the weights are inversely proportional to the distance between the treated and the controlled observations. So these weights would be equal to, and that k is the uh, kernel function, and then we would have, this would be the distance between pj and pi. Um, this would be the propensity score for the, match, uh, for, the, for the controlled observations that are matches, and this one for the treated observation. And h would be the bandwidth parameter for the kernel function. And in the denominator here, we would have sum of all of those. Um, for for the um, 
for all of the controlled observations that are matches. And the final one is this stratification or interval matching. And I talked about that where we compare the outcomes within intervals and blocks of propensity scores. Another thing that's used in propensity score matching is the term common support. And that means that we're restricting the matching only based on the common range of propensity scores. So for example, for the treated group, we may have observations with very high um, propensity scores, up, up to one here in this case that are going. But we would just use those um, up to here. And for these, say, in the treated group, there's no propensity scores that are less than 0.2. So we're going to throw away all the observations that have propensity scores of less than 0.2 uh, from the control group because they won't be very good matches and they will be outside of the common support. That's what this option means. Okay, so now that we found the matches and each of the treated observation has a very good match or matches plural from the, from the control group, what we will do is we will calculate these treatment effects, or basically what was the effect of that treatment. So the first way to do it is the average treatment effect, and that's a not a very good way. This is your straight comparing the outcomes and difference in these outcomes between the treated and the controlled ob observations. So you're ignoring everything that we talked about. So you can do y1 minus y0, and that's the outcome between the treated and the controlled observations. And here we would have the outcome for the treated, given that they're treated, and outcome for the control, given that they're controlled. And that's equivalent to a simple t-test between the outcomes for the treated and the controlled. So this is fine for random experiments, but in observational studies, it, this will be biased if the treated and controlled observations are not similar. So if we picked some of them to go to the treated group or they self-selected into them and they're different in characteristics, in X characteristics from the control ones, then that's not going to be a very good comparison. So what we need here is something called average treatment effect on the treated, ATET. And this one is the difference between the outcomes of the treated and the outcomes of the um, treated observation if they had not been treated. So this is the last term here, the outcomes of the treated observation if they had not been treated, that's the counterfactual and it's not observable because you can't have those treated remove the treatment away from them. So look at what we have here. So we have this is the outcome for the treated given that they're treated. Well we want what would be the outcome for the treated if they were not treated and they have Y0 as, as their outcome. Well, there's no such thing here. It didn't happen. So we need a very good approximation for that. And this is where the propensity score method comes because we can compare the outcomes of the treated and controlled observations. And this is saying that after we match on this propensity score, see, if we select those to be as similar as possible between the treated group right here and the control group right here, we can just straight uh, compare the outcomes for them. Make sense? Yeah. So we first match on the propensity scores, then we'll look at the outcomes. And this, and in this case, what we're saying is, okay, so we can't remove the treatment away from the treated group, but if we find a very, very good match for each of them in the treated group, then we would just get the outcome for the control group for, for the, the ones that are good matches and then that would be a fair comparison. So in practice the empirical estimation uh, here we have for each treated observation I matched with J controlled observations and their outcomes Y is zero are weighted by W. So this is the difference. This is the outcome Y1 on the treated unit, I. And for this I, we would have the matches, and those matches would be J. And those matches would have a Y0 outcome for all the matches J. And we're saying that we would add those weights, depending on I and J, 
what weights we put onto them and add all of these outcomes together to kind of calculate uh, an ev a weighted uh, average outcome and then we would sum it up over all of the i where d equals 1 for all of the treated observations and do 1 divided by n1 so that would be the, the so that would be the average so what we're doing here again um, if we just have say a, a nearest neighbor matching we would only have one match here we won't have to do the weight or the weight would be equal to 1 and so we would have y0 of j where j is the match and if we have the kernel matching we would use all of the y zeros for all of the controlled uh, observations and we would put weights if it's very close in propensity score that weight would be high if not that weight would be low another thing to notice here in this expression is that we're only looking for all the observations that d equals 1 basically we're only interested in the treated observations and finding good matches for them so as a consequence you might not be using all of the controlled observations you want just the good matches from the controlled observations and we may only use those so that's one thing to keep in mind and this is a case here where unlike say a probit or a logit model where if you flip 0 and 1 for the treatment you would get just the opposite results not true here for the propensity score matching because you could get completely different results um, if you're trying to now use the control group as a treated group and find matches for them okay so now I will talk about assumptions that we're using in this propensity score matching and some of these are a little bit hard so if you want to skip over that that's okay um, we we already covered what propensity score matching is but the first assumption is a partial equilibrium character basically there's no general equilibrium effect and this means that the treatment does not directly affect the controlled observations so what we mean here is suppose that we have uh, such a good program instituted say in some states but not in others but because in the program kind of have spillover effects that also affected the outcomes of the um, um, of the observations from different states so suppose we gave funding for online education for some in some states and people in the other state that didn't get the funding they also viewed the same online education and they got uh, also uh, treatment so this is not uh, again we're not assuming that that would have an effect on the um, on the controlled observations so no no general equi equilibrium effect the next assumption is conditional independent assumption and for random experiments we would have that the outcomes are independent of the treatment um, so for observational studies we would have that the outcomes are independent of treatment conditional on x so here we have y0 and y1 are independent of the treatment uh, given uh, those uh, those x uh, characteristics so we need treatment assignments that ignores the outcomes and this treatment variable needs to be exogenous like for example you can't say oh those students really really need the program and those students don't because then if they're very dissimilar like that then you won't have good matches and you won't be able to compare outcomes anymore So the next assumption is the unconfoundedness assumption and that's a conditional independence of the control group outcome and treatment and that's a weaker assumption than the conditional independence assumption. Uh, as you can see this term here is the same as this one only that we don't have y1 and in this case we're just saying well that at least it does not affect the control group the assignment into treatment does not affect the outcome for the control group that's very um, very important 
Um, the next assumption that we have here is the matching or over, overlap assumption. And this is that for each value of x, there would be both treated and controlled observation. And for each treated observation, there is a matched control observation with similar characteristics x. And this probability would be limited between 0 and 1. So here, what we're saying is that uh, we don't want to have a case where, say, the, the treated group consists of only young individuals and the control group consists only of old individuals. We have to have some overlap in those characteristics. We want some young and some old in both so that we can match on these as well. And the balancing condition says that the assignment to treatment is independent of the X characteristics given the same propensity score. So what we're saying here is that if we have the same propensity score, we would also have similar X characteristics. Uh, and we could test this assumption. So what we want here again is in the, in the previous example that I gave you, is if we have similar propensity score, this means that we also want for each age, say if a person from the treated group is 26 years old, we want to find someone that's a good match for 26 year old, which would be say between 20 and 35 years old or something like that, um, that is somewhat similar in age. And this is the balancing condition is that once the propensity score is similar, then we would also be matching on those X characteristics which would be similar. It's not like they would be vastly different between the treated and the control group. So usually when you have software estimation, they could test for this balancing condition and they tell you that it is satisfied. Okay, so finally we will talk about difference in differences model. And this model is applied uh, when panel data on outcomes are available. And we have before and after outcomes for the before and the after the treatment. And this difference in differences model is an improvement over the one period model. So here is the average treatment effect on the treated. Notice uh, here we have two differences. This is the outcome after the treatment for the treated Y1 and the control group Y0. And this is before the treatment B for the treated and the control group. And again, uh, we have a difference here. And, and so this is the differences here. And then we have a difference of those differences. And that's why the model is called difference in differences, because it's a, it's a double difference. And what we're saying here uh, is that if we have any difference between the outcomes um, right here in the treated group before and after the, the treatment, then we would use the control group um, to remove any bias in that. So let me give you a simple example. Suppose that we are um, we're using a training program to increase the income for a certain group. Yeah, but it, what if the income for everyone else, for the control group, also increased just because of like 3% inflation? So we want to remove that 3% or whatever the difference is for the control group, and then we would say, oh, that training program really had an effect. So it's important to have this, this control group. So um, in practical terms, uh, the way to estimate this model is basically to have um, in, in the program to uh, replace the, the outcome variable y that we had with a difference, the y after minus the y before. And then you can go ahead and estimate the models in the same way. Okay, so this is... All I had for the uh, propensity score matching models, thanks for watching and now you can watch the example and how to do that with different software. Thanks!